Hello everyone, my name is Nick, my pronouns are they, he, and I am the Liberation Officer at Leicester Students Union. Welcome to Black Trans Joy panel event, um, which is part of our Les Decolonize Festival. This event focuses on sharing the experiences of Black Trans Joy and how our panelists cultivate community, cultivate Black Trans Joy, and plus why radical self-care is so, so, so important. So we will be recording the session today so that everyone is aware. Um, and there are some ground rules just for the space today. So this is a safe space. Um, today in particular, this space is about living in your truth and not having to explain how and why you exist in the world. Therefore, please keep comments and questions respectful. Um, and if there is any unacceptable behavior, you will be removed from the space. Uh, there is a Q&A box where you can input questions to our panelists. Um, so please add questions um, and our panelists will answer them at the end. So now I'm gonna allow um, panelists each to introduce themselves. Um, if you could please tell me, tell us your name, your pronouns, um, field of, wait a second. I've made a mistake. We're missing someone. <laughs> Give me a second. There we go. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was like, yeah, everyone's ready. No, Koi's not here. My bad. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> hey, Koi. You good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Apologies, um, I started without you, that's my bad. No, sorry, right, don't worry, don't worry. Um, so I just went through the ground rules and was about to ask each of the panellists to introduce themselves. Um, so if you could please um, state your name, pronouns, field of work or study, and a personal song, and song anthem or poem that resonates with you. Um, just because you just got here, Koi, I'll give you a second to kind of um, settle in. Um, so if I could go to Tatenda first. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Tatenda. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I work uh, in the theatre mostly as like a writer, director, facilitator, sometimes I'm on stage. Um, and I also do academic research in Afrofuturism, which uh, for those who don't know is basically super awesome Afro-diasporic sci-fi. Um, anthem, that's what I'm missing. Um, I think the first one that comes to mind is probably like Put Your Records On by Corrine Bailey Ray. I think it's just one that like, you know, it's like that one where like it comes on in the house and like me and my mom will be like, yeah, we bop. Um, and it's just it's just a wholesome, wholesome little tune. That's fun. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Chloe, if you'd like to go next. Hi. So my mute was like <coughs> acting up. Um, hi everyone, I'm Clay Filani. Um pronoun she her. I'm a poet, artist, uh, black feminist, workshop facilitator, um, poetry working in ideas of like the imaginary, uh, black trans feminine people from uh before colonialism um in Nigeria. That's like some of the poetry and some of the art that I can sort of create around. Um, and then I'm um, or, uh, I'll probably say Aaliyah's more than a woman. I'm a big fan. I kind of always play her once a year. <laughs> um, I'm a both like Capricorn baby, so that's always in my heart. <laughs> I love that big tune, big, big tune. Um, Gazil, if you'd like to go next. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Kazil King. Um, yeah, I immediately forgot. Oh, what do I do for work? Sorry, I just started a new job. <laughs> I'm a customer representative for like a utility company. Nothing exciting. Um, but outside of that, I'm a part of Tea Time Podcast. Um, yeah, and it's just just been doing that podcast for trans people, about trans people, and the education of everybody else. Uh, song, a song, a song, a song. 
um, do you know the only thing that came to mind is um, Essence? Because I listen to this song every single time, like I've heard it for the first time. I don't know where it is, it just, it hits my soul. And uh, my mom just bought a new car and the first song I played was Essence to test the speakers. And she was like, wait, 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 play that song again. She was like, leave your phone in the car. I want to keep it played to the music, but I want to hear it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> It's it's a it's a serious song. It is. It's timeless. I genuinely believe that song is timeless. Honestly, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Cole, if you'd like to go next. Hello. Can you hear me, by the way? Cool. Uh, yeah, my camera's. It's not. It's not that I'm not dressed or anything. I'm dressed. I can't change everything. My camera's genuinely not working for some reason. Um, but my name's Cole. My pronouns are he him. Um, what do I do for work? too many things um digital marketing pr um the second half of tea time podcast with kaz um and an anthem oh an anthem uh, uh that's you know that's so hard because there's always good music coming out but all the old tunes are big tunes and i play them every day so but i would have to say my place by nelly that's a that's a tune yeah, no, I was expecting that, was I? Yeah, yeah, I see your faces. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I really wasn't expecting that, but a <laughs> great choice. <laughs> um, and last but not least, Koi, if you could introduce yourself, please. So, hi, my name is Koi. I use he/they pronouns, and I'm a student at uni. I study media, and then in my free time, obviously, I work. So, I work in a restaurant, and I model sometimes, and I create content a bit, and yeah. I think my song of choice will probably be Dysfunctional by Kei because he's a sick DJ and just bangs, so to tune, yeah. That is, yeah, that's a banger. Yeah. That is a banger. Favourite, favourite Kei Chinada song, though? Of all time? Yeah. Mm. I think it's just up there. It has to be up there. It's literally, it's either Dysfunctional or yeah. you're the with um Sid. Sid, yes. So yeah, because Sid's fire as well. So there's too many tunes. Too many good tunes. Bubba in itself as an album was absolutely amazing. Sorry, we're getting off track. <laughs> Thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, we're now gonna move on to our first question. So, what was your first moment of gender euphoria? Does anyone want to take the stage first? Um, I'll go. Yeah. Um, first moment of gender euphoria. It's definitely going to have to be the first time I ever wore a binder and then put a t-shirt on. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what do we have here? Like, I was like, wow, this is a cool experience. Apart from the fact that I felt like I couldn't breathe because it was squeezing the daylights out of me. <laughs> um, but apart from that, I would definitely say that was my first moment of like, rah, like, this, this is it, like, I'm, this is it, like, I feel like a shift happened in that moment. That's what I'd say, it was my first. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of people can um, resonate, can resonate to that experience of the first time, mm-hmm. um, experiencing that change. So yeah, definitely. Um, does anyone else want to go? Yeah, no, I really feel the specificity of that particular moment. It's once the T-shirt's on, because like once you when you put it on the first time, you're like, ah, oh, shit, it doesn't work on me. Like, you know, it's you, you're, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, like doing all the maths and it's like, oh, man, OK, that's fine. It, it won't achieve what I sort of wanted it to. And then you pop on the T-shirt and you're like, Gee. so that was I, I I feel you on that one. I think my my first one, like when when you're going to like get referred by like a psychiatrist to like deal with gender dysphoria, they often ask you these like really stupid questions about like, you know, your early life and whatever. And I ended up like when I was in one of those assessments to get on hormones, I remember them asking me like, you know, you know, trying to cite it back to like my childhood. But then I did actually remember when I was like maybe like five or six being like mistaken for a boy at the grocery store because I grew up in California and like at the grocery store like it's very very friendly vibes and uh there was this new lady working there 
at the, like our local grocery store. And she was just like, oh, your son, your little son is so handsome. My mom was like, ah, no. And I was like, um, I think that was like a, a really like a tiny kind of dumb early one for me. I love that. I love that so much. Does anyone else want to share? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in then. Oh. Wait. Yeah, is that right? Uh, Chloe first and then we'll go Chloe. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, I'm thinking. Um, I think it was like literally before I started transitioning and I was in the shop, like it was late night and there was two, there was two men in the shop, like working there. And I went to the like pay for my snack or whatever I had. And for, when they like basically heard my voice, they were like, oh my God, you're not a girl. And I was like, what? <laughs> and they were like, oh my God, you're too beautiful. You have to like, what does it say? You, you have to make sure you have a boyfriend. You can't be out in the streets this late, which also is like, okay, cool, sexist and all that stuff. But <laughs> at the time I was sort of like, you know, feeling feeling you like, ah, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, shave head. Like it was, it was, I was giving, like I've been given since day. So like, it was cute, it was cute. And yeah, it was a really great like moment to like, I could actualize myself a bit. I love that. I love that. Sometimes you just need that moment. It's like, mm, yes, I am that. <laughs> it is me. It is I. <laughs> um, Koi, if you would um like to share. Talking about like like childhood and stuff. And I remember being like eight or seven, as in like old enough to shower and you're in it. And in the bathroom, I would just like role play because my imagination was crazy in it. So like superheroes and like movie characters, I'd just be a guy in it. And as my mum's mascara, I'd do a little moustache and then get her eyeliner and do like the, the little like the abs and stuff. And it was like just dressing up and like balling your socks, putting in your pants, just like just feeling like happy in a kind of role you're playing was like, I guess my first instance of like euphoria as I was like a kid and then I kind of grew up and I was like, wait, people don't do this for fun. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like, mm hmm. That was like an early memory, I guess, like into that I got like euphoria from masculinity and itself. So yeah. And it's so beautiful to see like with all of these um these stories and moments that you've shared that it it, it all involves like innocence. Innocence and just like positivity of innocence. And I think that's just really a beautiful thing um that we don't always get to hear is um those those moments which may seem so mundane to other people can mean so much to us um, to affirm um, who we are as people. Um, thank you, everyone who shared. Uh, next question: um, Do you feel a pressure to resist the norms um, of society through transness, or is it something that you think comes to you naturally? If at all the question is quite uh loaded i understand um and i'm happy to repeat it um does anyone want to um question please yeah i can repeat the question that's totally fine yeah um do you feel a pressure to resist the norms of society through transness or is it something that comes naturally if at all um, I'm happy to hop in on that one. Yeah, go for it. I feel like I was thinking about it um, when we saw the questions at first. And I think like the only time that any pressure sort of emerges for me or has emerged for me is more like in interactions with like bureaucracy and interactions with like the medical sector, like the kinds of questions you need to answer to create a bureaucratic life for yourself as you transition are super reductive and black or white. And answering them correctly is like vital to getting the care and the services you needed. And then a lot of the time, because transness is supposed to be so out of the norm and so out of the mold, you sort of have to perform this like version of yourself that's like completely outside of society or whatever, even if you actually do have really meaningful relationships. And even if your life isn't only just isolation and discomfort, like obviously that's part of it um, when you're uncomfortable with your gender assigned at birth, but like it's really not the whole story. And I think that that's a time where I felt like, you know, needing to like 
perform uh, some random bureaucrats expectations of transness to get basic services like that's when I feel the pressure because otherwise you know my life already resists social norms anyways do you know what I mean like living as an artist and being an immigrant uh, and being like queer in the first place before transitioning being in an open relationship like there's so many different ways that like I have always been the type to defy social norms so if anything's changed in that sense since coming out I, I probably wouldn't have noticed because like I've always been doing it and I think that speaks to it being natural from the beginning, um, resistance just being natural anyway, um, whether it's intentional or not, um, but just coming from a place of um, how can it be resistance when it is who you are anyway? Um, so, yeah, I totally understand that. Um, does anyone else want to speak to the question? No, that's totally fine. Um, oh yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, I feel like I like um, being a trans woman. I feel there's like a lot of social pressures on like womanhood in general, and like the surveillance of my body just as a woman is already there. And so like, yeah, it's kind of hard to like not conform to like certain desirabilities and play up into that for like safety and access like I've definitely seen how the like further along I got the like more ease I had in performing femininity that I was able to like get decent jobs get people like wanting to connect with me and all that other bullshit so yeah I'll, for me it's it's hard to not want to take part in the sort of norms of like what people are most expect of like especially trans women um and also I've definitely like I'm like six years in myself so like being trans like 2015 or so like there was still a lot of like just sort of like you know just be a simple woman don't like be any sort of gender non-conforming or even like tomboyish, <laughs> which I sometimes like, like something so silly, but like very legit for me is like, I would have never worn like joggers when I first started transitioning. And now I like go to work and I'm like in joggers, like no makeup and chill. <laughs> and that's so small, but like the sort of, again, that surveillance, it's really difficult to evade it. And there's only like small bits sometimes I can break through, but yeah. I think that's a really like important thing to um to to speak about because so often it's 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 easy to think of transness or just resistance in itself as being something that um we have to fight the status quo if if we're we're activists in some sort of way but sometimes you're just trying to live do you know what I mean you can't come and kill yourself in this life and it's like it. it there's only so much that you can do in order to to be happy and also fight the status quo um in some sort of way uh which is why like i think it's Im important like included talking about like radical self-care and stuff like that um because as like by being yourself it is an act of radical self-care whether whether you think it or not um which i think is so important but also when you're speaking Chloe, it's something that i haven't actually thought about um from that perspective of the idea that actually like the possibility to not want to be not even want to be but you just you can't be resistant in certain ways that maybe you would like to be um due to safety which is the most important thing um so thank you for sharing that perspective um I realised that I didn't um, include this question, um, but I think it, it, it kind of ties into what I've been talking about in terms of uh, radical self-care and self-care. And I was just wondering, do, do you guys have anything in particular that you do for self-care or tips possibly for self-care that you would like to share with everyone? Um, 
Your camera finally works just as I'm about to talk. Okay, you go ahead and talk. No, 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 it's okay. You go, you go. Go for it, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was going to say a massive thing in terms of self-care that I think anyone can do is to take a break from social media. There are always so many different people we can compare ourselves to and that can get really tiring. Um, so for me, like I'll take a break for like a month from social media and it would just be so refreshing because I kind of stop looking at other people's lives and look at mine um, and stop comparing myself to other people and get a more of a sense of self by doing that. Um, so yeah, definitely that's that's a massive thing that I do. Thank you for sharing that. And um, Kazil? Um, so I was just going to talk about what I do for self-care. And I do this like religiously. I've extended it a little bit, but Sundays are my favorite day of the week. Like Sunday for me, like, yo, there ain't nothing better than a Sunday. Because Sundays I have like a routine um, of which is all a part of my self-care. Like the first thing I do on a Sunday is I wake up, I strip my bed, I put it in the washing machine, I run that, I hoover the whole house because cleaning brings me joy. I know that's weird, but cleaning brings me joy. <laughs> I will literally hoover the whole entire house, disinfect, wipe down everything. But while I'm doing that, or I miss a step, just before I do that, I put a face mask on so that by the time I finish doing everything, the face mask has dried. And I can jump in the shower and I can just wash off the face mask, wash my hair, completely wash my body, get out, um, shave my face, do my little face routine. And I'm like, yeah, put some fresh PJs on and watch Crime Docs for the whole of Sunday. Yeah, that for me, like it just brings joy to my soul because it's like I'm cleaning my environment and I'm like detoxing the area i'm making everything nice and clean because my whole thing is my space and how clean and clear it is brings me peace and if it's bringing me peace it's setting me up for the rest of the week so that's that's my that's my vibe big facts i like how it's like the, the duality of cleaning the space but also then getting ready for a new week mm -hmm. um that's just as important and mm -hmm. i might have to take some of them some of them some little things in the routine because um, do it do it yes I'm putting a face mask on while you're like doing your bits and then finishing just to like then go in the shower and completely just washing that off you feel so good and you feel like really accomplished you feel clean and it's like you come out and your environment is spotless and you just got like the whole day because for me it takes me what about 45 minutes to an hour depending on whether I've got a like clean and season me and do all of that kind of stuff 45 minutes to an hour of my Sunday from about 10 o'clock that's nothing because then I've got the whole day to just literally vibe yeah I, lo I love that recommend. highly recommend <laughs> I love that so much thank you <laughs> thank you for sharing does anyone else want to um, talk about any self-care tips or things that they do for self-care That's totally fine. Maybe I'll just oh Koi, go for it. Yeah. I feel like they've been mentioned already, but um like having a support system around you, as in like just chilling with your mates and going out, because it's like stress relief, isn't it? Because people that are like minded like you can get on with. It's just stress relief. So having them around you and just being able to relax in their presence, that counts as self-care because it's making you feel better, they feel better, everyone's just chilling. So that's a nice thing you can do if you're like, you know, bored or feeling a bit shit, just see someone that's like you and you can chill with them in it. Exactly. And it doesn't even have to be like some massive outing and stuff. You can just literally just be in the house in each other's presence, which is great. It's absolutely great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to move on to this question. How has community influenced your joy? And I think that fits perfectly with what Koi was saying just about um, being with friends. But yeah, how has community influenced your joy? Um, so growing up in Kent, there's not many people who are open-minded and queer and all of this stuff. Um, so it, it's something completely new to them. So there's not really much of a community here. Um, until I started going out in London, I'd say like post-pandemic. Um, and one of the first places I went to was Pussy Palace. 
and if you know me now you know that I, I'm like an ambassador for that like I'll never I'll never chat badly about it because that's my place like I love it um but that was a massive thing for me because I've never been around so many people who were queer or trans or just open and happy to be who they were um and that was the most probably the most refreshing thing I've ever done in my life um so yeah I hope that I don't even have to answer the question but yeah I just love it it definitely answers the question thank you (laughs) I think um even for me like I have a similar upbringing to you I grew up in Kent as well um so there was a lot of um a lot of white people um not that many queer people and if they were queer I didn't really get on with them like that we just didn't gel um and so trying to find individuals once I finally went like started clubbing as well in London and stuff and finding people it was like yeah this is where it's at this is where it's at (laughs) this is where it's at and I think even even now that I'm in I'm in Leicester in the Midlands and stuff it, it can be really hard to find community here but um, that doesn't mean that you can't branch out to other cities, go even further up north, Birmingham, Manchester, those places as well. Um, there's there's amazing organisations also doing the work um, to help uh, queer people of colour, um, black queer people. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely say um, looking slightly wider than maybe the pool that you're in is um, probably a good thing. Um, so um opening the question up again to anyone else how has community influenced your joy um i think like community is one of the biggest influences on my joy in terms of like i don't know queerness and transness i think often like i grew up in like suburban super catholic usa and like sexuality as a concept is already something that's just like you know we don't we don't do that shit here so like, I think when I when I left that that type of community, I already walked in sort of like with that sort of like stereotypical sort of isolation, I think, around around my queerness, where it wasn't something that I felt like had a space anywhere that I'd ever been. Um, but then when I moved specifically to London, I mean, I found a I lived in Switzerland before I came here and I definitely found a queer community over there, but it was really white and that, that came with its own problems. Um, Whereas here, um, I've just had the benefit of being in really beautifully diverse uh, diasporic queer circles, largely through like the theater. Um, being in the arts community in London is just such a, a special place um, where you can find people not only who share experiences with you or share identity markers, but are also sort of like sharing their thoughts on that at the same time. Um, because in the in the French theater scene down here in London, you know, it's just really, really full of fruitful exchanges um, from people who look like you and ha- and and share these things. So I think that it's definitely, you know, when you feel like you're understood and that you're being perceived without judgment, where it's like you don't have to avoid judgment by not being seen in a in a social space. You can actually be exactly how you are in full color, um, and you're still not getting judged for that. I think that that's yeah it's such a joyful and liberating experience so i feel really blessed to have found that um in the last couple of years and i was just wondering it's just follow up from that is there a difference in terms of i guess belongingness um belongingness is that what, belonging wow belonging <laughs> and in terms of the different countries that you've um you've lived in specifically within like the art sector Oh, totally. I think, I mean, I've had a kind of like, it, it gets a bit niche for me just because I was a first generation immigrant in the US, like the la- the layers of immigrantness for me go kind of deep. Um, but I think for me, I, I started off in a in like a musical theater community in the US. And that was very like razzle dazzle type energy. And it was just a ton of like, you know, young tap dancers with crackhead energy uniting in that sense. Um, and that was beautiful. And it was really beautifully queer as well which was really wonderful but i was quite young at the time so it wasn't the same and then moving to switzerland there was definitely a dip um i became friends with all of the arts kids and all of the arts kids happened to be all of the queer kids so that was kind of lucky um but it was much more yeah insular it was a much more homophobic landscape like in a more overt way um i think when i was growing up in the us it was like 
homophobic, but everyone was really into being like California nice. So you wouldn't really feel it except for being sort of like isolated in a, like a sort of subliminal way in the church and that sort of thing. But in Switzerland, it's much more uh, just in its face, German slurs at you type of thing. So I think that it was more like that, that community was a little bit less joyful just because I think we were united more by feeling like the struggle of being queer in a relatively, and it was like sort of like ridiculous because Switzerland is one of like, you know, the richest countries in the world with a ton of like really strong and stratified social systems. So you wouldn't expect it to be a problem and you'd expect it to be kind of easy to find, you know, ways to build communities there. But it is, um, I don't know, this is again, speaking as sort of like a jaded immigrant. And I think people in Switzerland who don't experience xenophobia and who don't have like the difficult access points into their culture find it really wonderful. But as someone who didn't have that kind of access off of the bat, it definitely was was less of a joyful feeling of community. And here it's like, we're united in everything. We're united in sharing at least three of the same exes. We're united in rage, we're united in joy, we're united in dance. Like we're just, we're, it feels really together in a way that I find really special. Um, yeah. That bit about being united by these two exes is the most funniest thing I've probably heard today because it's true. It's true. You know somebody, he knows somebody, he knows somebody. And they've been out with somebody that you know. Mm-hmm. And they know you. They sure do know you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, it's real. It's real. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to move on to our last question. And I would like each of you um, to give me a little sign, sign uh, for the last question. Um, what does Black Trans Joy look like to you? I won't pick on anyone because I'm, I'm nice. Okay. I'll go. <laughs> and if everybody wants to be quiet, I'll volunteer myself. <laughs> um, what does Black Trans Joy look like to me? Um, Black Trans Joy looks like to me like when me and the man them get together and we just go out and do stuff. It's like it's just me and the guys. We just we just do random stuff. Like we we don't do like dedicated like oh let's let's just only do this. Let's just only do this. We do stuff like um, we've done like four twenty events where we've met up in a park and we've just chilled, gone for food after. We've done things where we've just met up for food and drinks. We've met up to just play pool and drink a couple of beers or whatever. Um, I've missed out on the holidays so far but there's stuff like we'll go on holiday leave the country together do that kind of stuff and just having that sense of community with the guys that's what black trans joy looks like to me thank you that was who really are these guys Kazil? i'm trying to i'm trying to hop on the flight too yeah. <laughs> great so, um we, we can connect and because yeah we, we've, got, like, we've got a little something something going on that um one of the guys has just put together um and we're just kind of trying to get like more people so if after this you connect with me on socials i can lead you to the guys wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> i guess i'll go now i just sort of felt it, it passionate about the, the, hanging with the dudes um I think I think black trans joy to me looks like like uh like like dancing I think dancing like that's just like I think when like I find for me it's like opportunities to use my body in an unfiltered way where I'm just like loose like just dancing and in in a space where you can do that with other trans people is really really wonderful I guess yeah un unfiltered existence i think in general that's that's what it looks like to me i love that unfiltered existence that's really beautiful thank you who would like to go next there you go <clears throat> um black trans joy for me is like recently i did a performance piece with another black trans woman um like art performance piece and What's really interesting is beforehand, a lot of black trans women I know, a lot of them go south, we kind of isolate a bit from each other. But there's like slightly younger girls basically who are like creating communities and I've been a part of that and it's been so refreshing and loving and caring. 
and just creating a black sisterhood that like a black trans sisterhood that I haven't been that wasn't there before and it's really nice that like that's happening especially like in the UK um so yeah that's kind of where I've been able to access like a sort of communal as well black trans joy um and taking up space in those ways as well which is important taking up space because we I feel like we don't always feel like we can take up space in certain areas so when you feel like I, I am completely safe in this place and I can it's a wonderful feeling so I'm really happy that you have that um Koi or Cole you'd like to go next um so I've recently been quite invested in like the ballroom scene and the UK um and obviously there, there is a category called realness um which is it's called breaking up for everyone trans. else yeah 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 male and female people um and obviously there is the number so that is like just a specific amount of people are there and walking the cat agree um and you know they're feeling themselves there yeah he's definitely having wi-fi issues <laughs> Oh, could it be possible you could turn off your camera and then um, repeat yeah, what you said, up, please? They're getting tens across the... Yeah, he's, he's lagging. Can you hear me now? Yeah, try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay, right. So I was saying before my Wi-Fi was shit, which I'm assuming it probably still is, um, I'm, I've been invested in the ballroom scene for a while now. So, you know, obviously there's a category called realness and obviously seeing all the black trans people who go up and walk that category is definitely, you know, black trans joy to me because everyone's, you know, really comfortable in themselves um, and really confident. Everyone's getting tense across the board. Everyone's just enjoying it. I hope you can hear me. I'm not just like speaking for no reason now. Oh, okay, cool. You can hear me. Great. Yeah, but that is that is Black Trans Joy for me. I just love I just love seeing everyone go up there and just really get excited about being trans. Like everyone's just so happy to be trans, and it's quite wholesome to see. So yeah. Can I ask a really quick question about just like your experience in the ballroom scene? Is that like bad to hijack this moment? I'm just really curious, just because I mean I've been to a couple of balls in New York, and I've come over here and been to a few balls here and like all of the OTAs, for instance, that I've been to, it's like the realness category shows up and nobody's walking. I wonder if that's changed since I know like over the summer, there was a lot of like Vogue writers doing so much stuff and like it might be like, the landscape yeah. might have been changing a little bit. But I also found like, I don't know, realness for me is something that I'm like, I, I'm really happy to hear that you in the UK have had like a positive experience with it. Because for me, like I, when I was in New York, I was like, damn, these men are very real. <laughs> I feel very fictional in comparison to these dudes with their pecs and their, you know, the 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 mug. It really they're they're really they're really giving uh in that moment. And in London, it feels like, you know, like every time I've been to a ball, it feels like the category shows up and it's like crickets. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna now. So yeah, I don't know. I guess I would love to hear a little bit more about like your experience in the scene here. Do you know what? I have seen a lot of balls where people won't walk in it. Literally, is like tumbleweed like that. Um, so yeah, I did get that. But there are obviously both rights do their little thing on Mondays, and there is another event starting on Fridays now as well, where more people actually do walk. And I think it's about people feeling comfortable to do the smaller events than the big balls, because obviously the big balls a lot of people attend that it is quite daunting um and it is scary like I've seen the US ones and I'm like I am never doing that in my entire life absolutely not I am fake I'm not there is nothing real about me no way but I think it's just 
I don't know what it is and why they look so different, but I think realness is about authenticity and also being true to yourself and what feels real to you and conveying that when you walk instead of just trying to look as technically trying to look as cis as possible, which is a lot what a lot of people confuse it with. Um, obviously, the category is to kind of look cis, but if you're walking and you feel real and that comes across, who's who's to say you're not real? Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent. I feel like now that London, I mean, I hope I I feel like it does. Like it feels like London has a bit of a a bigger kiki scene than it did, uh, even in like recent, like in the last like year or so. It feels like that's maybe increased a little bit. Um, and I feel like being able to have access points in before you're in like a massive main house ball is like really really helpful for that. Um, and I really like what you just said about like the idea of like feeling real. You know, if you feel like you're presenting masculinity in a way that's like comfortable and strong to you then like hopefully like the judges would see that um I'm I, maybe this has inspired me maybe to have a little bit more trust so that's really cool thank you thank you um so our, our last um individual is Koi. so I think trans joy like black trans joy has a mention about all of us and I think it's confidence because you need confidence to go on holiday, go out with your mates, to dance, to walk, just to take a space in general. Like, I feel like, I don't know, it's just anything you do is an act of confidence or defiance. Like, t- you know, posting stuff on social media or just existing in yourself, that's an act. And I think that everything we do is some kind, some form of trans joy in a way, and it all depends on confidence. So, yeah. A little summary of everyone's little points, like just come in it. But yeah. Thank you for sharing. That was absolutely beautiful. No <laughs> um, before I move on to ask if the audience has any questions, um, <clears throat> please feel free um to add a question into the Q and A box for those who are watching now. Um. But yeah, my question, it's a bit selfish, uh, but I want to know the answer. How do I grow facial hair? All right. Because I'm on, I got, I got the minoxidil, right? I got the derma roller and I'm out here trying. <laughs> I need tips. Yo, because... you've got everything you need straight up. That's all you got. But what it takes is consistency. This okay. is what the man them are forgetting. Because what you need to do, it's like brushing your teeth. And in the morning, it's on. In the evening, it's on. And you do not drop that routine. Because if you do, she will fall right out. And it's heartbreaking when that happens. Just keep fighting the good fight. Man, I got, I got the peach fuzz and the little whiskers. The little whiskers on the side. I was, I was shouting at my mom the other day. I was like, look, man, look, the sideburns. They're going crazy. She was like, they always look like that. I was like, why? Like, come on. Just let me have this. Trust the Let process. me hope this. <laughs> it's rough. It's rough. <laughs> it is. It is. It's rough out here, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. <laughs> Any other tips? Kazil, yeah. I'll add one more thing to that. Mm. So I would say um, creaming your face was normal, letting it dry for like a minute or so, then adding your minoxidil without like rubbing it in, just like, you know, paste it on, put it all in your bits, let that dry. But when it dries, it dries your skin. So what I do on top of that is I have like this beard oil. I literally just drop like a little there, a little there, a little there. And then I just moisturize it in, but like not like rub it in and just let it. So do that twice a day. I've been doing that for about a month now. And all of my patches are no longer patches. They're like coming up together. The little patch that I've got at the bottom is starting to fill out. Like by the time I go to my barber in like either next month or in January, he's going to be like, rah. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, it's, it's keeping your face moisture is important, but I would say if you're going to do that after, get like a, get like a little beard oil situation going on um, just to keep you from having like dry skin or getting like a rash because it can happen. So yeah, that's my only other tip, but it's, it's working. I was in the mirror the, like yesterday and I was like, mm, it's working. <laughs> Consistency. I did it before, um, during the pandemic, my facial hair was nuts. And then I had a moment of madness and decided to shave my face. Yeah, not doing that again. 
I agree. I feel like just patience in general and your little minutes routine. And if not, just get a girlfriend in it and just see what happens. But there, there's a like, <laughs> those are your options. It's all you got right now. But just see what happens. <laughs> but it takes time, so you'll be grand. Don't worry, don't worry. I'm so glad I was on mute because the cackle I just made in this office. Oh my gosh. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> thank you for the words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions from individuals in the audience? Or anything that the panelists would like to ask um, to the other panelists? That is also um, welcome as well. I'm just going to say thanks for letting this black trans woman get into the subject. <laughs> I didn't know y'all guys had to do all of that. <laughs> oh, okay. So T doesn't just like give you the beard. Not necessarily. Oh, by no means. Nah. You it's got to graft. You got to graft. Yeah. Jeans, but you have to graft. Like, it's work. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, good to know, good to know. I'm not really no black trans girl secret, but like, you know, like, that was cute. <laughs> and this is what I love, this is what I love. Like, even though uh, this is like a panel event and stuff, this is still a kiki session. And I, I, I really appreciate this. I appreciate all of you for taking the time today um, to share your experiences. Um, I mean, hopefully this will give um, other individuals more insight into our lives and experiences. But also this, I'm not going to lie, this was for me as well. Like, I, I appreciate um, talking with community. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll open the floor once more to questions, if we have any. Um, I'll give it like... 30 seconds. Um, but if not, um, once again, thank you so much. Um, panelists, if you are able to, could you drop um, any ads or um, websites you may have? Or please also feel free not to do that. That's totally fine. But if you would like to um, in the chat, that would be great. So individuals can follow you. I'll make sure tomorrow on my Instagram, I will also put the ads um, for everyone to see. Oh, I also want to do a picture, but I'll wait. I'll do a screenshot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we have a four minutes left, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Once again, thank you so much to everyone um, who came today. Um, I just want to say again, thank you to our amazing panelists for sharing experiences with us today. Um, a lot of trans conversations focus on the negative or the bad. And I think it can be really um, refreshing to hold conversations of joy and love. Um, and to also remind everyone that we are here existing and thriving and doing things. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone has a restful evening and um, stay tuned for more events and merch um, from our Leslie Colonize campaign. But yeah, thank you everyone. Bye. See you.